Well, hello everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar, HACCP in an Hour, organized by the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. My name is Lauren Gwynn, and I'm the co-coordinator of MPAN. I'm based at Oregon State University, and I'm your host today, and very ably assisted by our program manager, Catherine Quambeck. MPAN, for those of you who don't know us, offers webinars on topics related to small-scale meat processing and farmers and ranchers who raise meat for local and other niche markets. If you'd like to be on our email list, please sign up at our website. I've just posted the URL up there in the chat box. And if you have webinar topic suggestions, please email me, and I'll type my address into the chat box here in a minute. So MPAN is a national network of processors, producers, universities, agencies, and nonprofit groups building and supporting the processing infrastructure that's essential to bringing local and regional niche meats to market. Our mission is long-term stability and profitability for both processors and the producers who depend on them to market those meats. Our advisory board is drawn from industry, academia, nonprofits, and government. Three things before we start. There'll be plenty of time for questions after the presentation. If you have clarifying questions during the presentation, we can also try to take those. Jonathan is willing to take those along the way. To ask a question, you please type it into the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. Second point is that this webinar is being recorded, and we will post it on our website for later viewing with the presentation slides. And please uh, feel free to share it with those who weren't able to make it today. And we will get to as many questions today as possible, but if your question doesn't get answered, please email me after the webinar, and we will try to get it answered. And again, I'll post my address there in a minute. So our agenda today, HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point, has been around for decades as a food safety management system in many different industries. Starting in the year 2000, USDA required all inspected meat and poultry establishments to have a HACCP plan in place and to follow that plan. So what is HACCP? How does it work? What are the basics? On this webinar, you're going to learn the ABCs of HACCP, the vocabulary and the basic concepts from an experienced HACCP instructor, Jonathan Campbell from Penn State University. If you're a farmer or rancher who brings animals to an inspected processor, or if you're thinking you might want to get into the processing business, or if you just want to know what the heck HACCP actually is, you are in the right place. So I want to introduce our speaker. Jonathan Campbell is a meat science extension specialist at Penn State University, and he is, we are fortunate enough, uh, a member of MPAN's advisory board. Dr. Campbell, who is a South Carolina native, began his career in the meat industry in 1998 with a basic meat science course at Clemson University while working as an undergrad in the meat lab. From there, he went on to complete a PhD in meat science at Iowa State University. In 2013, Dr. Campbell joined the animal science faculty at Penn State University, where he currently serves as extension meat specialist. So please, introduce us to HACCP, Jonathan. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> As Lauren said, HACCP is really a fancy acronym because we like to use a lot of acronyms in the meat industry as well as other industries. But HACCP is an acronym that really stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And HACCP is a comprehensive, systematic approach to applying appropriate science-based methods and technology to plan, control, and document safe production, handling, and preparation of foods. But what in the world does that mean? Uh, really what that means is that HACCP is a food safety tool. It is a way to encompass everything that a food company does, specifically in our cases, we're talking about meat processing establishments or poultry processing establishments. It is a way to keep track of records. Is it a way to show that observations were performed at correct intervals as specified in a written, complete document that is verifiable and justifiable? HACCP covers food safety issues and is applicable from farm to table. So we can use the idea of HACCP and principles of HACCP for all parts from production all the way to preparation for our consumers. And HACCP really focuses more on prevention of hazards rather than inspection, command and control, if you will, by an outside inspection agency. Does that mean that we do not need our inspection agencies in the food processing world? Absolutely not. 
but I will talk later about how we have shift, shifted the burden of food safety and proving food safety by the use of HACCP and what HACCP means. <clears throat> so HACCP really deals with those unintentional types of hazards, and we'll, we'll explain what hazards we are talking about that could come into contact with our, with our food production process. And so HACCP deals with those unintentional hazards that may arise during production and or processing or even preparation for those of you out there uh, pre preparing foods for consumers directly to our customers. Does that mean then that HACCP is all encompassing? Absolutely not. It does not control for anything that is an intentional act. We have other programs in place for that in our meat industry, which we refer to as food defense plans. So HACCP really deals with those hazards which are unintentional <clears throat> that could enter into our production or processing chain. As we think about the history of HACCP, HACCP really has its roots in the, the space program and NASA. So HACCP was developed in the late 1950s and early 1960s at the Natick Army Laboratory in conjunction with the Pillsbury Company and NASA. And so for those of you who have seen wonderful videos of liquids or gels in space or a non-gravity environment, they kind of float around particles everywhere. And so any of you who know someone who has had a foodborne illness or can imagine what a foodborne illness would be like in space. This is not something that would be ideal to all the high-tech electronics, at least for the, the day and time. Those high-tech electronics would be very sensitive to a foodborne illness that would occur in space. It would also probably not be a, a very suitable or fun thing to have to deal with. So HACCP was really intended or started to try to prevent that foodborne illness from occurring while our, our astronauts were, were in space. And the way they were statistically trying to do that in the first place was to test well over 50% of all the products that were made to determine if that product was safe enough for the, the space program. And that is obviously a very cost prohibitive way to go about testing. You, you also cannot test your way out of a food safety problem. So if something's there, sometimes looking for a food safety issue is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So they had to come up with a better, more inclusive and reputable way to find and eliminate potential hazards that could enter into the food production system. <clears throat> HACCP as we know it today really has its roots from the National Advisory Committee on Microbial criteria for foods, and that, that committee was formed in 1988, and they really set forth what we know as today our current concepts and principles of HACCP. There are seven principles that really guide the development of a food safety program or HACCP program, and these principles were, were issued in a 1989 report that this committee put out. With regard to regulations in HACCP, we may say that, all right, in 1993, we had a foodborne illness outbreak known as the, the jack-in-the-box outbreak, which is fairly common knowledge to, to most people. And uh, this was, HACCP was not a reaction to that. It, it may have helped produce, um, put bills through our regulation process a little faster, but HACCP was really starting to be talked about in place. But you may ask yourself, so what, what happened between the 1960s and the 1990s that caused us to, to think about why we needed this? And so with some of the history involved with that, there, we saw, started to see emergence of new pathogens. Technology has advanced and evolved rapidly during that 30 to 40 year span. And so we were able to detect new pathogens now that we weren't able to detect. And so the regulatory process was set forth. And in December of 1995, we saw our first regulation for HACCP. And this was specific for uh, FDA product in the seafood industry. And so that, that really mandated that 
all facilities that, that process seafood uh, for human construction, for, excuse me, for human consumption are, are now mandatory to be under some sort of, of HACCP program. Less than seven months later, we saw regu regulation for HACCP in our meat and pol poultry industries. And this is known as the, the pathogen reduction HACCP final ruling, uh, termed also as the mega reg. And this was passed in, in July 25th, published July 25th, 1996 in the Federal Register. And what this mega reg did was really outline who had responsibility for what, what the plant or processing establishment was supposed to do, what our inspection personnel was supposed to do, and this is the major switch that I was talking about. The burden of proof is now on the processing establishment and no longer on our inspection agency. And so HACCP became a household name for meat and poultry plants overnight. <clears throat> if you read some of the first beginning paragraphs of this 185-page mega reg document, we see that the intent of the HACCP regulation was, quote, designed to reduce the numbers of pathogenic microorganisms on meat and poultry products, reduce the incidence of foodborne illness, and provide a new framework for meat and poultry inspection. And has that been successful? We'll talk a little bit about that later in the webinar. But it did, in fact, change how that entire framework of inspection occurred and whose responsibility was food safety in the first place. And so the answer to that question is it's everyone's responsibility, not one specific agency. <clears throat> if you look at the implementation dates, we see that for we've been under our HACCP regulation in the United States for meat and poultry plants for at least 14 years. The HACCP regulation showed that for those companies, large companies that have greater than 500 employees, they've been under a HACCP ruling since January of 1998. <clears throat> those companies that have between 10 and 499 employees, we call those small establishments, have been under a HACCP ruling since January of 1999, and everyone has been implemented by at least January of 2000. So we have 14 years of history to really decide if this food safety tool is working. But before we can get to the HACCP principles and applying a HACCP system or food, this food safety tool in our processing establishment, there are some prerequisites that really must be met in order for the system to work properly. And I've listed here three of those examples. And one is simply what we call GMPs, or Good Manufacturing Practices. These are really best practices across the industry and really outline very general statements. For example, all employees must wash their hands before returning to work. It doesn't tell the employee how to wash their hands. It doesn't get specific into what temperature of water they should use, what soap they should use and all those types of issues. But it's, it's a good best practice that after going to the restroom, having a food break, smoking a cigarette, or anything like that, employees should wash their hands. We can move a step further into a little more specific how-to instructions in something called SOPs, or Standard Operating Procedures. And these are a list of, for example, maybe how to put a piece of equipment together, or how often to perform preventative maintenance in certain areas of our plant, how often we're going to do these things, how we're going to do it, and in specific detail. So that someone coming in that is new to our establishment or is auditing our establishment can look through this document and decide what, as far as preventative maintenance or operating procedures that we are doing at, a, at certain regular intervals. <clears throat> we can move upwards and be even more specific to something called SSOPs, or Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures. And these are those specific how-to instructions on how, where, and how often our sanitation practices will occur in our processing establishments. 
For example, we may clean our contact surfaces or cutting boards, knives, hand tools, things like that, using different methods than we would clean our, our walls or ceilings or uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning ducts at, at different intervals, using different, different procedures or even different chemicals. If we think about HACCP as a pyramid, we need some basic education and training as our good basis for that pyramid. And you can imagine, if you don't have a good basis in our education and training, our GMPs, our SOPs, and SSOPs, HACCP really doesn't work. So if you, if you use a pyramid as an analogy, that pyramid or triangle that you see on your screen doesn't stand up too well if we don't have that good basis for all of these types of prerequisite programs and education that we need in order to make HACCP a successful food safety tool. So but before we have HACCP and implement that process in our establishments, we've talked about some prerequisites, but there are some things we need to do with regard to developing the HACCP system and that HACCP tool, and that is really to assemble a panel of experts, if you will, or a, quote, team that know our production process within our specific plant. So everyone who may, for example, make hot dogs may do that 10 different ways. So what's specific to one processing establishment may or may not work in another processing establishment. That panel of experts then needs to list and describe all the products that they're going to be making um, in something that we call the product description. And I'll show you an example of this in the next slide. And then we can take that product description and really think about the process to make a, a schematic or a, a pictogram or a picture of how that process is flow in something we call a flow diagram. And I'll show you a picture of that or an example of that in just a second. So when we think about the product description, it's, it's a, probably a one page or maybe two pages, very simple list of questions that that panel or team of experts within our processing establishment have gone through to really describe the product and its uses. If an example we have here, we see that the common name of this product is simply beef or beef variety meats, and that would be all the edible organs that consumers like to eat. We describe how, how this product is to be used, how it will be packaged, how long and at what temperature we can hold this product, where the product will be sold and how it is intended to be used, any special labeling instructions that should be considered, and any special distribution control that should be considered. When we think about the flow diagram, that flow diagram, as I said, is really a schematic of the entire process. And without an accurate flow diagram, we, can, we cannot move forward with producing an adequate HACCP plan. And so if we are missing steps within our flow diagram that that, that team of experts didn't think about, it really invalidates our entire work that we've done to try to really think about all the food safety uh, tools that we need to utilize to keep our product safe for our consumers. And so this all-encompassing picture of our process should be self-explanatory. We should receive products, for example, or raw material that you see at the top there. We should have a place to store that. And maybe that is not as an important part of the process as, as, say, cooking a product, for example, or packaging the product, or storing the product under refrigeration. But all steps in the process must be considered in order to have an effective HACCP plan and food safety tool. So now we get to the meat of HACCP, if you will. And that is, what hazards are we really trying to deal with in a meat processing establishment. And we have categorized three basic types of hazards. We have biological hazards, and biological hazards would really include any bacteria, yeast, or molds 
are microbiological hazards, specifically those pathogens or bacteria that can make us sick. How we control these biological hazards depends on the process itself. We can evaluate chemical hazards, and this, this would be, for example, uh, cleaning residues, any type of um, maybe antibiotic residues in livestock, or even allergens, if we have an allergen uh, control program that, that deals with those type of chemical hazards that might make our consumer sick. And then the third type, basic type of hazard is a physical hazard. This would really be foreign material, anything that should not be in our product. For example, bone fragments, wood, metal, plastic, or even broken glass. Um, not all plants have use, use glass in their, in their production practices, but that's why, for example, we may need to think about having light bulbs that, that are shatterproof because everyone at least probably has some sort of lighting or light bulb associated in their processing establishment. And so all of these types of hazards need to be evaluated thoroughly to really take into account all the hazards that could affect our consumers of our product. Now we get into what we call the heart of HACCP, and those are the basic seven principles on which HACCP is founded. Those seven principles are one, hazard analysis, two, critical control point, three, critical limits, four, establishing monitoring procedures, five, establishing corrective action procedures, six, establishing record keeping procedures, and seven, establishing verification procedures. So HACCP principle one is to conduct a hazard analysis. And in my opinion, this is arguably the most important HACCP principle because if you do not have an accurate view of all of the hazards involved in our food production and processing establishment, it really invalidates the rest of the process. And so during the hazard analysis, our HACCP team or team of experts in our processing plant will get together and list all of the potential hazards from raw ingredients, raw processing materials, all the processing steps involved from our flow diagram or even equipment involved if that could produce a potential hazard in our production system. And after this list is assembled, the team can then really decide if that risk needs to be addressed in the HACCP plan. And what that means is they're going to evaluate all hazards that are identified on a couple of different attributes, one being how severe is the result should, should this hazard occur? In other words, I'll use the meteor, meteor example. If a meteor hit the earth in the next 20 minutes, most of us on, online and listening to this webinar would probably not be alive to listen to, to the exciting end that is, that is coming up. However, what is the likelihood that that will occur in the next 20 minutes? So those two types of risk assessment really need to be taken into consideration when evaluating all the potential hazards that could enter into our process. Principle two is critical control points, and critical control point is really any step in our process where we can control any of the three basic types of hazards, biological, chemical, or physical hazards, and that control is necessary to prevent the hazard from entering the process, eliminate the identified risk from production, or to reduce that hazard to an acceptable level. Obviously, prevention is ideal. It's not always applicable. So sometimes we can only reduce that hazard to an acceptable level to ensure that our consumers are not getting ill or having a problem associated with our food products that we're producing. Principle three is establishing critical limits. And a critical limit is any value that's identified that is necessary to prevent, eliminate, or reduce that hazard to an acceptable level at a particular critical control point. An example of this would be, for example, cooking products to 158 degrees or 160 degrees, or if it's poultry, maybe 165 or 170 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that could be a critical limit that is established for the safety of our food products that we're trying to, to produce. Principle four is establishing those monitoring procedures. And in, in the monitoring procedures, we're really outlining a series of planned observations or activities that must be performed at an extent established time frame. And an example of that would be hourly or every 15 minutes or maybe only daily. That really depends on what, what we are trying to monitor and how feasible it is to monitor what we are trying to monitor. And so what, what the monitoring procedure does is to ensure that the critical control point is being properly controlled. The next principle is corrective action. And corrective action are really a list of procedures and items that we as, as establishment members need to take care of that must be followed when we, we fail to meet a critical limit. For example, in our cooking example, if we don't meet 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 170 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever our limit set point was, what are we going to do with this process to ensure that we either A, get that product up to temperature or make sure that that product does not injure any people by being consumed. And so this really acts as a, as a fail safe, if you will, or some, at some level of redundancy to our, our HACCP system. At the end of the corrective action, our process should return to a state of control if our corrective action is done properly. Record keeping, principle six. So principle six is probably arguably the second most important, if not the most important. So that I would, you could argue either way whether the first principle or the sixth principle are the most important. But why, why is record keeping important? Well, it's more than just proving to our inspection agency that we have not had a problem occur or how we're going to deal with that problem if it did occur. It is really irrefutable evidence that monitoring of a particular critical control point occurred during food production. And this really provides an invaluable history to our processing establishment to make sure that our processes are running as we intended them to run. And so that record keeping, nowadays we have a lot of third party audits that have nothing to do with the inspection agency. And so those third party auditors for maybe a specific retailer would, would ensure that those records are accurate and that is then that irrefutable proof that we have performed our food safety system as it's intended to perform. The last principle is probably one of the most confusing principles for a lot of processors and in general, uh, the general public. Um, and that is verification. Verification really has two main parts. And those two parts are validation and verification. I was always taught that you don't define a word by using the same word, but in this case, that could be where some of the confusion occurs. We have verification as one part of the verification principle. And so we'll talk about the first part, and that is validation. And validation really determines the effectiveness of our food safety plan to make sure that we are producing safe food. And it really de decides, is our food safety tool controlling what we are intended to control, how we are intended to control it, and by how much it is intended to control? Verification, on the other hand, are really that those procedures to ensure that the HACCP system is working as, working as designed. And an example of that is really we are checking the checker. And so an example of a verification activity would be that we would observe one employee taking a temperature, for, for instance. And a statement that I have here in this slide is probably pretty meaningful you can actually verify that you are doing what you say you're doing on an invalid system. So maybe it's not, maybe that temperature is not controlling the hazard that we've identified during our hazard analysis that we need to control, but we're, we're monitoring that properly 
and we verify that we're monitoring that properly, but our HACCP plan is in, still invalid. So that's how I try to explain the difference between validation and verification. So here's the question you've all been waiting for, and that is, does everyone need HACCP? And the answer to that is obviously as confusing as you would, you would have hoped, and that is yes and no. And so the, all of those processing establishments that are processing under federal or state inspection need at some level a HACCP plan for all the, the products that, or product types that they produce. And so some processing plants that, that you may deal with um, maybe are exempt from this HACCP ruling. Uh, because they are exempt from certain levels of inspection. And a, an example of this would be the retail exemption. And so in a retail exempt plant, they, they are simply buying in inspected or those, those products that were produced under HACCP and inspected plant products. They're using that source to simply make that product into something else for retail. For example, they're buying in whole ribeyes, slicing them into steaks, and putting them into a retail counter. Those type of establishments don't currently have to have a HACCP plan, at least at some level. And then there are custom exempt plants. And these are, these are the custom exemption really has to deal with those producers who have maybe finish out just a few head of livestock and want that animal harvested and brought back to their home for their own personal use. And this product is not allowed to be sold or enter into commerce. So that's really the biggest difference in those two types of exemptions for, for HACCP and for inspection. But as we think about HACCP 14 plus years later, HACCP is really a commonplace term nowadays. And in most establishments, it's not nearly as laborious as it was when it was first implemented. We have a good understanding of how this food safety tool should be used and then how those records should be produced in order to provide that irrefutable evidence that both our customers and our inspection agencies are looking for. We've even evolved the concept or principles of HACCP to apply to attributes of quality control. Uh, now, I told you in the beginning that HACCP was designed as a food safety tool, but the principles themselves have been applied to also deal with quality issues. We now have the third-party audits that I talked about, and for example of that would be Safe Quality Food, or SQF. And a lot of, a lot of these third-party audits are now a, a requisite or requirement to do business with specific retailers uh, that are major retailers in the United States. And the ultimate question that I asked earlier is, okay, we have this food safety tool, we are able to use it and document it, but is it really working? And remember, if you remember, the original intent was to reduce the incidence of foodborne illness to, to our customers. So we have other hazards that we're dealing with, but is, is that intent really working? And in some of the data that I'm going to show you, really except for Salmonella and Vibrio species, have, have we had little change in increase? The rest have declined fairly well, okay? And so when we see statistics like this or graphs like this, and this was put out by the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention, if you look at from the inception of HACCP until current times within the last year or so, you see a, a fairly steady decline. What you also notice in this graph is that you see a lot of ups and downs. And the, the reason for that is whenever you graph foodborne illness, you, you always have some seasonality uh, associated with that foodborne illness. And so that explains a lot of the, the ups and downs associated with foodborne illness in the United States. The problem with this graph is, for example, the US media would see this Vibrio number and that makes headlines. You now have a 112% higher incidence of Vibrio infections or Vibriosis in, um, in our consumers. And so what Vibrio has nothing to do with, with uh, USDA plants. Vibrio is really a, a marine organism that causes foodborne illness in undercooked shellfish specifically. 
And all of these foodborne illnesses, we should note, were in um, consumers that are over the age of 65 and potentially have some sort of immunocompromised situations, maybe just by their age in, in, uh, in general. <clears throat> And so with, with regard to HACCP and food safety, we, HACCP really helps us to avoid the mentality that you see in that online search for the word food safety. When I, went, when I did an online dictionary search for, for the word food safety, I got this answer. The word you've entered isn't in the dictionary. And so food safety has now become a part of our daily dictionary in meat processing. It is the primary goal of all meat processors in the United States. And HACCP is just one of the many tools that we use to do that. For those of you that are really looking for HACCP resources, this webinar obviously does not allow you to have some sort of certification in HACCP. It just is meant to be a starting point for understanding what HACCP is, and hopefully we have achieved that. But there's a lot of resources associated with HACCP. Some were already on this website, and if you need to wait a minute to, to copy this down, keep in mind that we're also recording this. So if you go to the Niche Meat Processors Assistant Network website and look at this or need to review this webinar again, you'll have that for your uses. And so with that, I will actually stop here and have plenty of time for questions. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was excellent. We have a couple of questions that came up, and um, the first one here had to do with could you sell both retail and wholesale processed meats, for example, sausage, if um, you have a federally inspected and approved HACCP plan? And my answer to that was if you're operating under federal inspection, then yes, you can do that. And then the question is, well, do you need approval from the local health department and my first thought is, well, no, but then I, you know, I know that sometimes because of food code, health department gets involved, maybe having to do with different products. Do you have any thoughts about that? So the, the real situation is the, the retail part of that store. They, they have to have a retail license, and that is why sometimes the health department gets involved at all. But the health department... At, USDA should supersede any local or state health department with regard to their regulations. And so I would encourage, if they're having trouble with that, to really contact their, their district office to, to work through that. Um, not, not to belittle those state and local health departments, um, but HACCP does work. And so, you, the, in my opinion, the establishment should not be penalized uh, for, in, in other words, having to do two different types of, of HACCP programs, one for the state and one for um, USDA, or, or in some instances we have states with state meat and poultry inspection, which is different from that health department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then typically when you have health departments who require HACCP plans for certain products because of food code requirements, then that's not daily HACCP plan checking. It's in the same way that FSIS does. There's a couple of questions that have come up here about retail facilities, retail exempt facilities, I think um, is what they're referring to, about doing processed meats like sausages or salamis. Don't they need some sort of HACCP? And, you know, the retail exemption is very complicated about what they can and can't do. Could you go into that a bit? Yes, and so a lot of states are adopting, uh, Lawrence talked a little bit about the, the food code. Um, there is a new food code, the 2013 food code that, that FDA has adopted, and it really is in um, a result of the Food Safety Modernization Act. And so some of that is changing, and it's really a state-by-state -state issue. Um, how certain states or how quickly certain states adopt this uh, FDA 2013 food code really it will determine whether or not your processing establishment, if it is retail exempt, should have to have a HACCP plan and how that HACCP plan will be uh, inspected, enforced, and what have you. Well, just to clarify, just to clarify, food code has been around a lot longer than um, Food Safety Modernization Act. But you're right that certain states have adopted different pieces of it. I mean, I think one of the pieces here to answer Rebecca's question is 
the Oregon Department of Agriculture is gradually, the food code requires, um, because I know Rebecca's in Oregon, the food, um, the, the Oregon Department of Agriculture is beginning to require retail exempt facilities that make certain products to have HACCP plans for those products. And they're working out the details of that without getting into all of the weeds about which what those products are, I mean, I think that's the kind of question that you really want to check in with your State Department of Agriculture about what their specific requirements are at that point. That's correct, um, but I would, I would ask, I would ask the, the department which version of the food code that yes. they have adopted, because yes. there, are, there are many different versions of the food code out there that are updated and changed. And so the two questions are, which version of the food code is my state uh, using to enforce the regulations? And second is, what what specific product types are affected by that food code? And then the, the third, probably one of the most important is, how is that product packaged? Because there's there's a whole different variety of, if, if I'm vacuum sealing product versus if I'm over wrapping product, and how that really relates to where the, where the, the HACCP line is drawn. Great. Thank you. There's a question here about what about retail markets using a vacuum sealer? I know that that's also something. Um, oh, reduced oxygen packaging, too. Uh, th those are things that are starting, the regulation of that is starting to get tightened up based on the food code, too. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And so <clears throat> the, new, the, new code, the new food code, as well as a lot of the older versions of food code, have always, if you are doing any type of reduced oxygen packaging, whether that be vacuum packaging uh, in, in, in a pouch, tray sealing, anytime you're changing the oxygen level in the environment of that product um, in, in what the food code defines as reduced oxygen packaging, uh, HACCP plans will be required. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Janice uh, Hochstetler from um, Iowa is very correctly pointing out that food inspection is not always in the State Department of Agriculture. And in fact, here in Oregon, it depends on whether you're a restaurant or a retailer, and sometimes people are kind of both. But there's we have it in the Health Department and also in the Department of Agriculture. Um, as she's pointing out in Iowa, it's part of the Department of Inspections and Appeals. So you have to be very careful to know in your state who is responsible for that kind of food inspection. That's correct, and, and Iowa is one of those, one of those states that, that has state meat and poultry inspection, and so um, that, that, that could be part of the difference for there. It's, it's really where they find a place to have funding for that type of inspection. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But it is, it, it's, not, it's not specific to the Department of Agriculture. Thanks for pointing it out, Janice. Well, and I also think what we're seeing, I keep coming back to Oregon because that's where I am, we're seeing that those departments are having to learn a lot of new things because this hasn't traditionally been maybe their expertise um, in all of these different kinds of processing because it's, um, and those agencies are having to sort that out. So a question that came up before uh, from Brian, do you think we need to look into getting a retail license from local health department? Brian, we, we can't really answer that until we know what you're trying to do, but maybe the discussion we've just been having is useful. Um, there's a question here from Rebecca again. If you ask your processor to use a different spice mix for a sausage, would, would that processor have to submit a new HACCP plan for their minor recipe change? And, and I don't think so. Would they, Jonathan? No. No, no, no they would have if, – if they're it, – it depends, it depends on if they're – if the – the, your intention is to sell the product retail. They may have to um, do do a label change, uh, but that has nothing to do with necessarily a HACCP. It, unless there was something specific to the spices and maybe the spice had an allergen in it, then they might have to uh, readdress that product specifically. And so there's a lot of scenarios where, yes, you may have to readdress that HACCP plan, but as a general rule, anytime you change anything in the process, you don't necessarily have to develop a new HACCP plan but they should, you should reassess the effectiveness of that HACCP plan and is it, is it now encompassing, we've changed something, so is it now encompassing all the hazards that we started with? Exactly. Folks, Jonathan covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time. Very clearly, I might add, Jonathan. Well done. Um, are there concepts, terms that folks would like him to go back to, to dig into a little bit more?
I think it was so important what you discussed, the difference between verification and validation, because that's something that can trip people up. And if folks have been paying attention over the last few years, there's been um, a change in how FSIS um, handles validation. There's new guidance about how plants have to validate their processes. Um, what's the status of that, Jonathan? Are they, I mean, we've got a final guidance document. How are you seeing that? being implemented? Um, I, I'm not currently. Um, there is there there is a final document out, and um, it, to, I can't speak for the agency or FSIS or any other state agency, but in, in my opinion, this is something that, that has always been a part of HACCP um, from its, you know, roots in 1989 when that report was put out by the National Advisory Committee. And so it's, it's not something that is that is brand new. Maybe how the agency or how they're training their employees to to look for specifics to make sure that both components of verification are being followed and implemented properly is is probably the biggest change. It was it was I won't say it was an assumption. And will will we ever get to zero cases of foodborne illness? That would be ideal. Um, is that plausible? I'm not sure that zero cases of foodborne illness is... I think the answer is no. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think the answer is no. Um, and, you know, one of the things that came up through that was, um, with validation, was people would use scientific papers as their justification, but then, at least according to FSIS, folks weren't actually, their processes didn't match that scientific Paper. That, that's correct, and I, I, I review asset plans, I won't say as much as the agency does, but I, I review them on a fairly regular basis, and I see oftentimes um, c confusion on the processor part because of, I, well, you need a piece of scientific documentation, but the other part of that is it really needs to match what process you're doing. If you, if you are trying to reduce E. coli in your ground beef, for instance, and you're citing a document that has to deal with um, E. coli in um, ham, those, those two things don't really fit by either the product type or by the species. And so, so there's something different associated with those, those types of hazards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A question here um, about even though exempt uh, poultry operations operating under the 20,000 bird exam uh, exemption, for example, they're not required to write a HACCP plan. Would you recommend one? Um, and if so, where could they go for advice? I always recommend if you're producing um, meat or poultry to use some sort of uh, documented proof that you have a food safety uh, system in place. And why wouldn't you want to bask in the glory of having a HACCP plan associated with your, your, your poultry operation? Um, is, it a, is it a little more work from a, a record-keeping standpoint? Absolutely. Um, is it worth it in the end? If you're really trying to produce something that's sustainable and traceable and you have no documentation to, to show that, you have not achieved that. And so as far as resources, I would start with maybe your local land grants or some of those many um, websites that are listed on the Niche Meat Processors website. And, and maybe take a HACCP course. Um, there are some decent HACCP courses that are online, but I, I generally like the face-to-face the -face interaction at some level with the basic HACCP course because there's a lot of issues that arise um, with, it, with uh, learning about the, the specifics of HACCP and how to apply those principles. Yeah, that, and being with other businesses working it out is really useful in my Absolutely. experience. There's a question here. There's um, great questions coming in. I think this one is going to be quick. Does return product need to be addressed in the HACCP plan? Absolutely. And do you uh, need to do a I, hazard analysis on the returns? I, I don't know that you need to do, do a hazard analysis. It may, it may need to be mentioned in the hazard analysis, but how you're going to, to deal with return product or dispose of that product should at least have been thought of. And, and maybe that's, uh, that is just a simple statement somewhere within, within the hazard analysis that all return product will be disposed of and 
and, and how you're going to deal with that is really the important thing. Mm-hmm. Question here about what are some of the most common mistakes or oversights that you see in the plans that you review? Most of the common mistakes that I see is forgetting to, you know the process better than anybody else, but you, when you're putting it down into a flow diagram, uh, you forget, oh, yeah, we, we do that as well. I forgot to put that down as a step. And so that may sound very simple, but, and, well, that, that invalidates my entire HACCP plan, and unfortunately the answer is yes. Um, you have not adequately thought about every step or every ingredient or every process that could affect the safety of this meat product. That's probably the most common mistake that I see. Mm-hmm. Um. Let's see. A question back to the returned product. Could you say handled on a case-by-case basis? I would say that's a little too vague. You need to really decide in in what those case-by-cases are. Um, uh, That answer is just a little too vague. And, for example, some companies don't take return product. They just encourage the disposal of that product. Um, and I, I don't know, it, most small businesses can't afford a lawsuit, and so is, is it really worth trying to recondition product or, or rework product um, for small amounts? That, that, that's, a, that's a business decision that I can't answer for you, but I, I, think, you're, I think the answer on case-by-case case is, is a little too vague. What about software programs for flow diagrams that you're suggesting? Uh, honestly, I use Excel because it's already nice, neat boxes, and I'm used to, to using. I'm not doing a plug for Microsoft. Any type of word processing or um, a spreadsheet software is, is usable. I, I'm currently not aware of specific HACCP software because um, USDA and state agencies don't require a specific format. Um, how it works for you, my, my best advice is to make sure that it's clear, it's legible, you can read it, and that it's accurate. Um, and so as far as software is concerned, that, that's just what, what I use just because it's easier. Um, and I can put many different um, parts, colors, lines, uh, circles, squares, that sort of thing to make that flow diagram flow, if you will. Mm-hmm. Is there a HACCP plan for composting? Uh, if you want to create one, we would now have a HACCP plan for composting. But you can, <laughs> as I said, you can you could apply HACCP principles or a HACCP plan for um, how how to build a lawnmower to how to compost uh, manure. So absolutely, you could have a HACCP plan um, for for composting. Is you there know, a standard yeah. generic plan for that? I don't think so. I don't know about a generic plan. I would suggest, I mean, we always say the go-to on, I mean, for composting, I assume we're talking about awful composting, Um, Cornell's, um, I'm I'm blanking on the name of the the program within Cornell that has the expertise on this. We did a webinar on awful composting a few years back, and you can find that on our website, and it's got all that information. So I would go to them (laughs) for that. We can try to dig that up. But the principles are still the same regardless of what you're doing. You need to outline, you know, all the steps in the process, how how the product would flow and what the end product is. And, and uh, sure, you could, you could do a, a, a HACCP plan for composting, but I'm not aware of one. Mm-hmm. Oh, and thank you, Catherine, for posting the site. So Actually, this is, I have one. This, this is Catherine. Um, you know, Jonathan, we, we might have a couple of folks on here watching and listening in that are that are new about to start a meat processing facility or something along those lines. And so could you maybe give a general timeline? You know, you watch this webinar. Uh, maybe we can click back to the slides with the resources. You check out some of those resources. Um, what's the next step? Would you say folks go to a half of course? Should they hire a consultant? And also any thoughts you have on consultants probably would be helpful too. Okay, good good question, Catherine. And and as far as the timeline is concerned, that's that's the the timeline is going to be up to the individual and the complexity of the process. And so, what may take a, a simple retailer one month to to complete and understand and implement might take someone with a more complex system 
um, three to six months. And so there, there is, I don't have an exact number for a timeline as far as that's concerned, but um, always, always, at least one person in the plant should be certified in the principles of HACCP, and that's by taking a, a basic HACCP principles course. Um, and, and most of those are through a face-to-face -face inter, uh, interaction. And so you'd have to attend a, a two to two and a half day course, depending on how that particular agency or um, workshop um, is put on. But there's a there's a not necessarily a requirement for for numbers of of hours that you have to take. But everybody does their their HACCP programs a little bit differently. And then as far as a consultant is concerned, um, a consultant's only as good as the information that 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 you tell that person. Um, and always use a reputable consultant. I, I deal with uh, teach HACCP courses all the time where the processor will tell me, we, we had a, a consultant hired and all they did was cut and paste the generic plan and, and maybe changed our name at the top of, of it to show our company's name. And HACCP is not a, a cut and paste uh, activity. And so I would be weary of a HACCP consultant that does not want to come to your plan and go through everything you have currently and everything you want to do uh, in the future. Uh, and so because you cannot accurately write a HACCP plan without actually getting into the plan and understanding the process. And this is very much, I mean, you, you need to learn it, live it, breathe it, and because you're going to be dealing with it or the person who is responsible for HACCP in your plan is going to be living it. And you need to be able to defend it if an inspector says, well, what about this? What about that? So it's something, it's a living document, obviously. There's a question about, um, do all the critical limits of the supporting documentation need to be listed, written out in the HACCP plan? And I think maybe this person means the hazard analysis part of the HACCP plan. If not, could you reference the critical limits in a standard operating procedure? Um, I had thought that all the critical limits had to be in the HACCP plan. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the main principles. And so if you're, so you may have a piece of scientific documentation that's justification for a decision you made in many different parts of the HACCP plan. Maybe it's part of the hazard analysis. It could also be part of uh, verification. It could also be part of your critical limits. It could also be part of your monitoring. And so any document there that you're using to support the decision, you should have a copy of that document and any critical limits associated with that paper should be, should be listed. Could you do it the other way? Absolutely, but the, the more complex you make the system and confusing for yourself, the more complex it's going to be for someone to review it. So that sort of leads into this next question. If a submitted HACCP plan is not acceptable, will the agency tell a processor what is wrong with it? And that <laughs> can be tricky. <laughs> Um, that is a great question, and I, I would love to have someone from inspection or FSIS uh, to answer that question. I, I'll, I'll touch on an answer to that, and that is it really depends on um, it really depends on on the inspector. I, I hate to say that, but in my experience, I've worked with some really great people in inspection, and so don't get this idea that inspection are, are um, um, hard to deal with or that they have a job to do. Um, and so, so some of their job is not always easy. And just like dealing with, with your customers or with businesses, there are great people everywhere and there are not so great people everywhere to have to deal with. And so you have some, some inspectors that, that take the, the regulate to educate um, mentality and some are, are bullies with a badge. And unfortunately, um, that that is the scenario, and because are they required to tell you what's wrong with it? No, because it's your HACCP plan. Um, but I definitely know of inspectors who say, "Well, don't tell anyone I told you this, but you know I've heard that," <laughs> and right. they have given suggestions. They're not. Yes, it is your HACCP plan, and they're not technically supposed to tell you what to do because they moved away from command and control. But that's, some are very helpful. Right. And, and part, of, part of that is because of the shift in, in the burden of proof. They're, they should be able to tell you what parts of your HACCP plan are lacking. Right. Um, 
Unfortunately, they'll sometimes just cite a, a regulation number to you. For example, 9 CFR 417.3, your corrective action is, is not adequate. Well, well why isn't adequate? Um, and so that can be a source of frustration. That would be a, a point in which maybe a, a consultant meeting with a consultant, you already have something in place, would be a, a, a good idea or good source of money as long as it's affordable to you. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate it. Um, and this is this has been just so much great information. Folks asked really good questions. Um, and I hope this has been a really useful introduction or reintroduction to HACCP. Um, as we said, we will be posting this uh, webinar online with the slides. And we may even dig into getting it transcribed because it's such valuable information that would be very useful. Um, so we'll be posting that to our website. And I believe Catherine's probably typing in the website address right now. And we're going to send information when it's posted out to our list. So if you are not on the MPAN list, please join us. Uh, you can join from our homepage, which, yes, Catherine just posted. And we will um, – we're doing another webinar in June, on June 25th. Catherine, do I have that correct? On the economics of dry curing. So uh, that one is at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll also be sending out a note about that to our listserv. So again, thank you so much, Jonathan, for sharing all of that today with us in such a clear and understandable way. And we will see you all the next time. Thanks very much.